for NBA champion Tony Massenberry with the San Antonio Spurs. Tony, when I was sitting up here looking at all these different things going on, I felt that I had to get somebody in, and I always uh, can count on you, and uh, you do a great job of uh, letting me know what's been happening. But before we get started with stuff outside of this area, uh, how did you think the Wiz did in the draft? I thought they positioned themselves well in the process of, of setting the foundation for the future. When you look at the draft picks, they really kind of covered the uh, the entire draft as far as filling positions on the team that are needed. They got a stretch four. They got a, a, a wing player. They got a guard. And basically, you know, this is a team that's setting themselves up for the future. They're starting from scratch. And, and when you do that, you need to not only draft good, meaning good young players that you can develop, but you also want to put yourself in a position where you have draft picks for the future. And all of this has to be done uh, with the new rule changes in the NBA under the CBA that um, that are now a little bit more restrictive in the way of, of keeping teams, keeping everybody sort of at the same level when it comes to salary cap. Well, I think when you look at it, they continue on with the draft, they signed uh, Valanchunas, uh, not to, well, to last night or the day, whichever one it was. Uh, yes. He, big man. How how does very that uh, position? Man. Huh? Yeah, very big man. <laughs> very big man who over the last few years have, have sort of really – punished the Wizards a little bit on the interior. He's a guy that's gotten numerous offensive rebounds over the course of games he's played against the Wizards because the Wizards just didn't physically have anybody who could match up with his size. He's also not just a big guy who can really get you some points and in, in, in production inside, but he can also stretch the floor out to the three-point line, as he had also shown the Wizards over the years. So he's one of those guys that uh, has played well and played consistently uh, for the pretty much the last four to five years, but he's played really well against the Washington <laughs> Wizards in whatever encounters they've had. Well, when you you play for twelve different teams, and yep. you also when you end up with the Spurs, so the Spurs is a, a franchise that has ran well, and you've been working and doing stuff with the Wizards for a long time. Watching things now, how they've been done and utilized and handled. How does it look compared to what was there before? Because right now these people seem to be, they have a plan and they implement it as they go on. For me, I would look at what they did in OKC. When mm -hmm. you think about the fact that OKC stockpiled draft picks uh, four or five years down the road, that's kind of what's happening here when you look at the Wizards and what they're doing right now and the players that they're drafting. These are guys who hopefully – in the next three years will will be guys that we look at much like Bilal Koulibaly um, on draft night. Some of us were left scratching our heads when he was drafted. And by midway through the season, we were saying, wow, you know, we didn't know that he could shoot the ball like this. We didn't know that he would be show this type of promise this early. Wow. What a mature player for his age. Like, when you look at Will Dawkins, these guys and, and Michael Williams, they have a track record of drafting well. They they select the right guys in the draft. And I, and I got to tell you, B. Mitch, we're in a time right now in the NBA, we're always talking about players and players' contracts and their production. Well, to me, with the rule changes right now, this is the time where we have to start looking at general managers and, and, and executives and saying, okay, these guys also get paid well. It's time for them to start showing us what they got as far as making the right decisions. And when I look at the two uh, guys and Will Dawkins and, and Michael Winger who are running the Wizards organization, I feel like we have two of the best executives in the league, and they have proven that they have a great track record with the things they have done along the way in the past. So I think the Wizards organization is in great hands. I think they're making the right moves. I think they're drafting the right guys, and I think they're really setting a foundation that's going to pay off down the road. You've been here a long time, just like I have been, you know, and I, I, I was saying earlier, I'm getting excited because they seem to have the right people in place at this point. Listen, a lot of times, all these franchises, they had people that were favorites of the owners and they kept them around. Right now, they have guys that know how to build a team, and they really could care less if they like you or not. They just want you to make sure you're playing very well for the team and trying to go out there and be successful. 
Well, that's the difference between <clears throat> hiring people that you like, hiring people that are connected to people that you know, mm -hmm. and actually going out and hiring the best basketball people that you can find. And that's what, when I, when I look at the scene now, that's what's happened. They have <clears throat> hired really good basketball people, and that's going to pay off for you down the road. All right, the NBA seems to be in the transition at this point, okay? I understand LeBron is still playing, but I don't know if LeBron is still the guy that he was, okay? And uh, Father Time is undefeated. Uh, He's not. <laughs> yeah, Father Time is damn sure undefeated. Klay Thompson seems like he will be leaving uh, Golden State. Paul George just opted out, and he's going to, to uh, Philadelphia. The NBA's got a lot of things going on, but my question would be, did you expect – I'm going to start off with, with uh, the Lakers. Did you expect Bronny to be drafted and with the Lakers? I expected Bronny to be drafted with the Lakers, um, you know, a, a, a month ago. Mm -hmm. I expected J.J. Reddick to be hired by the Lakers over three months ago when basically I felt that J.J. Reddick would be hired as the Lakers coach as soon as I saw the podcast between him and LeBron. Mm. And, and to me, the funny thing is, it's so obvious. Uh, you know, this is a different league and, and, and this is a different time. In 2024, things are not just don't work the way that they worked in 2004 or 1994, you know, back when you and I were, you know, still in the, in, in the, in our primes and, and, and playing, you playing in the NFL and me playing in the NBA. It's a different time. Things work different now. Relationships matter. Twitter followers, social media <laughs> followers matters. Those things weigh in. And, and again, things outside of the game, to me, at this point in sports across the board, have more influence in sports than they ever have. So um, when I saw that podcast between LeBron and J.J. Reddick, I put two and two together, as, as a lot of people did. Uh -huh. When I saw that Bronny was actually coming out after averaging single digits in college and, and really not being a, a star on USC's team, and he was still entering the draft, and there was all this hurrah, big hurrah around him coming out, I knew that he would end up being drafted by the Lakers. Mm. So um, these things, to me, some of them are, are kind of easy to see. But, it, again, it's just a, a, a different time. It, it's a different time. But, like, when I look at this thing, and I just like I say, if everything works out great, oh, good. If things don't work out great, because this be – because, you know, LeBron – so LeBron is behind all of it. If things fail, is this to be LeBron getting ready to be out of this league real quick? If it fails, no, I, I don't think it'll be LeBron being out the league. Um, he signs for three years or he's, you know. He, he's I mean, he's going to get his money, but I'm saying you start seeing things go the other way because if it doesn't work like this, I don't know if any other team is going to play this little, this game. I actually don't think it matters. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think when I, when you talk about LeBron, a, a guy who is in the GOAT conversation, um, I will always have Le Michael Jordan in front of LeBron regardless of, of what mm -hmm. he does. From this point forward, I give LeBron a ton of credit yeah. for being able to maintain a high level of play for longer than anybody has ever done it. Um, but when it comes to uh, his decision making, as far as his imprint on all of this, uh, I just don't think that it will hurt his legacy uh, that much because the people who are loyal to LeBron are, are going to be loyal to him regardless of what he does. Mm -hmm. What it, the, the what leaves me scratching my head is that. And for me, in the business of basketball, it should be about winning. And in the process of, of winning, sometimes you don't always get to do what's convenient or, or uh, you know, what you might like to do. When I look at what the Lakers are doing, it, it just does not feel like it's about winning as much as it's about basically uh, appeasing a narrative or, or putting on the show. And I, I've said this for a while, long before um, this situation came up with Bronny, that for me, the, the Lakers, to me, don't feel like it's about winning as much as it's about filling filling the seats in, in, in the stables or the uh, Crypto.com arena. It, it just, if it's not about winning, be mission, what's it really about? Yeah. So I, I think the Lakers is really 
that at this point. It's the late show. All right, they got a show going on. But it was just it's a little strange to me because when you look at the NBA, the Lakers is one of those teams that were – you didn't think they needed to worry about playing those games because they are the Lakers. Right. But they went into right. it as well. Well, Paul George uh, goes to Philadelphia. What can we expect in this team now? Because we've seen Paul jump around a lot now, and we've seen uh, Philly get their players. Will that help them or not? It will absolutely help them. Uh, they needed that third guy. They needed that that wing player in particular to be a threat, um, and to be able to, to do some of the things that you see Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum doing in Boston. This most certainly, this move, takes the 76ers into uh, the, you know, the, the conversation of being challengers at, at the, to the Boston Celtics. Now, does it put them over the top? That remains to be seen. Yeah. But it certainly puts them closer. Let's not forget that even without Paul George last season, if it were not for the injury to Joel Embiid, the Sixers were right there. Tyrese Maxey was playing great basketball, and, and they got a great two-man game. And you look at the Sixers roster, they don't really have a lot of depth and they didn't really have a, a lot to throw at these other teams after Joel Embiid and Tyrese Mackey. But they found, you know, guys to be able to contribute here and there. But they certainly, you could see a glaring uh, void on the wing spot where they didn't have that dynamic three that they need. Now they've got a guy that can sort of give them some minutes you know, at the three and maybe the four if they want to play small. And being that they lost to Bias Harris to Detroit, you know, now they're going to have to fill that board as well. But Paul George, uh, to me, is a, is a good upgrade on the wing. The thing about Paul George that, that troubles me a little bit, just like you just stated about Joel Embiid, they are absolutely great basketball players, but they both are hurt a lot. Yeah. So you're yeah. expecting two people, that's the third piece, and two thirds of them can be gone at any time. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's been an issue for both of them. Yeah, you're right about that. That that right there is something that's a little troubling. And, and hey, I don't have a problem with a man getting his money at all. That's the NBA how they set it up. But hey, get your money. But the ultimate thing, if I'm building a team, I'm going to build people that I can depend on on a consistent basis. Well, another guy who had injuries kind of seemed to have derailed the way he had been playing. Clay Thompson was. Unbelievable playing defense and can shoot the three on anybody as good as anybody else out there. He seems to be on a move from uh, Golden State. Where do you think he ends up? You know, that's a tough one for me because when I look at Clay, um, it, see, here's, here's the thing. Let me start by saying this. I'm going to keep it as short as I can. I have been saying for over a year that Clay Thompson. No disrespect. I love Clay Thompson's game. Mm -hmm. Clay Thompson, because of injuries, because of, and not just injury, major injuries, yeah. back to back major injuries, because of age, it, which it happens different. It, it, some guys are, are starting to, to tail off a little bit at 33, 34. Some guys tail off in their late 20s. Clay Thompson is not the Clay Thompson that, that, that established the Slash Brothers. Oh, let's, no. let's not forget. Yeah, he's not. Clay Thompson <laughs> had the reputation when he was in his prime as a as the ultimate three and D guy. He was a great defensive player on a Warriors team that was a number one ranked defensive team when you when you go back to the glory days yeah. of the Warriors. All right, and he was clearly the second best shooter in the entire league behind the best shooter we've ever seen in Steph Curry. Yep. What's happened to Clay over the last couple of years is injuries have taken a toll. He is aged. He's played a lot of minutes over the course of his career. So he cannot defend his position the same way that he used to. He cannot get himself open and create the separation from the defense the way that he used to. So when you add these things up, he's not the same player. And that hurts the Warriors because – that's just what happened. As you just said, be missed. Father Tom is undefeated. Yeah. <laughs> He's undefeated. That's what happened. Now, with that being said, anybody who signs Clay Thompson is not getting the guy that he was five years ago. Yeah. So who can really benefit from having basically now at this point in his career, a catch and shoot off guard, maybe even a three, because he struggles to, to, to keep twos in front of him as well as three. 
He's not the same guy defensively. Yeah. I think when you look at the Dallas Mavericks, I think he would be great there. Um, I, he could help the Lakers. Yeah. But the Lakers also need some a, a defender. You know, a guy not not a guy just can only shoot. They need someone who can also defend. And, and I question that with Clay his mobility at this point because of injury. So um, I, when I think about what's the best fit for Clay, I think the best fit for Clay right now would be the Dallas Mavericks because you got Luca there who could set him up very well. You've got Kyrie there who can who can take up a huge uh, point, huge part of the scoring load, and he wouldn't have to be the guy to come out and score twenty plus every night. And I think it would be offensively, it would be easier for Clay because he wouldn't have to move a whole lot. And defensively, because of the upgrades that that they made um, by way of the trade last year, that ultimately helped them get into the conference finals. I think he wouldn't have to have so much put on him defensively as well. So I, I just think the Dallas Mavericks will probably be the best spot for him. There is a chance he could end up in L.A. if that's what he wants to do. But I think Dallas would be the the, the best landing spot for him at this time. Well, if I were him, I'd go to Dallas because they don't pay uh, state taxes, and he pay a lot of taxes in uh, L.A. <laughs> in, uh, in, so. in California. And, 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 <laughs> exactly. And he's taking a pay cut leaving the Warriors no matter where he goes. There you go. There you go. Well, Tony, uh, we are joined by Tony Massenberg on the Beck Hill guest line. One question, uh, we we now, Tony, we are we are in the 21st century now. We we stream the show as well. So we got a lot of guys. And one guy, Tay, Tay Wilson, I think his last name is, wanted to ask about Georgetown and uh, Maryland signed. Uh, um, three-year deal now to play with each other? Yeah. Your thoughts yeah. on that, on that series? I think it's great. I think it's I, – I'm so glad. I wish we could have played Georgetown when I was at Maryland. Um, that is a great rivalry. That is a that is something that I think, even from the recruiting side, I think would help both programs and, and, and really help bring the rivalry back. Uh, you know, we never really had that rivalry because even going back to Lefty Giselle and John Thompson, they didn't play each other. And so I think with these being the two most prominent schools in the D.C. area, I think it would be very important that they renew this rivalry. And, and I think it would be great for both programs. And I really think that it could enhance recruiting countrywide, not just in the area, but countrywide. I think if you develop this rivalry, it could be very, very beneficial to both programs and really highlight uh, local talent, you know, for, for both teams that have guys on the on the teams that are local, I think it really highlights the basketball uh, history and just the overall great basketball that's available in this area and, and just puts a real spotlight on the DMV as a whole. So I love the rivalry. I, I, I just I, I think it's the best thing that could happen to both programs. All right, Tony, man, I appreciate you giving us some time, man. Thank you, and congrats once again, brother. Oh.